the live stream uh, broadcasting from Hyderabad and uh, we have Dilip Donde, <clears throat> Captain Dilip Donde. He's a retired naval officer and this is an unusual uh, 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 lesson for us in terms of the fact that we've always had the chief national coach and has been technical and nutrition and stuff. But this is adventure sailing, very different from competitive sailing. And uh, I think it will be an exciting uh, piece. Uh, uh, Dilip, <clears throat> Captain Dilip went unassisted circumnavigation of the globe under sail from April 2006 to May 2010. And he planned and executed project Sagar Parikrama, which involved constructing a sailboat from scratch and in India and then sailing it around the world. So uh, he's the first uh, solo circumnavigation and he was the 190th person to complete the journey. So this is going to be a series where we're going to have uh, Captain Donde followed by uh, um, Abhilash Tomi. And then he's done two voyages, including the Golden Globe. And then you're also going to have uh, Krishna and then hopefully Tarni will come on. Uh, like, so this is going to be a series. And thanks very much, uh, Captain, for uh, being with us. And I hand over the uh, microphone to you. Thanks, Rohan. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk to sailors. And, uh, and morning, everyone uh, uh, attending. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story of, of, of my trip in these. Uh, most, or a lot of you would, would, would be knowing uh, pieces of it. Some of you would be new to it. Uh, so, uh, firstly, a little bit of background. Uh, I wasn't a, uh, wasn't a sort of a regular sailor, so to say, like uh, many of many of you in this group are. I didn't have get the chance to sail as a as a young man, as a as a teenager, and I started sailing only when I joined the navy in, uh, in 1989. Uh, and I was mainly a weekend sailor. I wasn't much of a competitive sailor. I enjoyed uh, taking my, I just enjoyed sailing, that's it. I wasn't too interested in the competitive part of it. Uh, well, I continued doing my job in the Navy. And in 2006, I got to know that the Navy was looking for a volunteer to sail solo around the world. And uh, it, it really excited me and I immediately uh, volunteered to do the trip. The whole idea, as many of you would know, was mooted by retired uh, Vice Admiral Manohar Auti. Uh, and he had been telling the Navy for many years to do something like this. And, uh, and that's how the Navy started looking for a volunteer. Now, when I, when I volunteered for this trip, I had no idea what it is, what it involves. What is circumnavigation, sailing circumnavigation and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly touch upon uh, what what is a circumnavigation for people who don't know about it, and then uh, quickly go over uh, my trip, and uh, and then the what I have been doing, and then I leave some time for question answers, uh, and and do do come out with any any and every question that you think of asking. Uh, so when I volunteered for the trip, I started doing some research on the on what is a circumnavigation. And uh, I came across, uh, you know, certain thumb rules for a circumnavigation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So you can see on your uh, screen, uh, you know, these are the conditions for a, for a circumnavigation, uh, for a sailing circumnavigation, basically. And uh, some, most of the conditions are quite self-explanatory, you know, uh, start and finish in the same port and... Uh, cross all the meridians and cross the equator. Uh, it should be more than obviously the circumference of the earth. What is important is the second condition, which is that you should not pass through any canals or straits. Because if you pass through a canal or strait, like if you go through the Panama Canal, go through the uh, Suez Canal, you are forced to motor or use uh, a tow. And then it doesn't remain purely a, circumnav a, uh, a sailing circumnavigation. Uh, so, uh, and the last last condition is also important that it should round the great, three great, great capes. So, if you see, um, if you keep these conditions in mind, 
you know, you don't have much choice, uh, but to your only option is to go south of all the continents. Can we have the next slide? So you see, that is my route. Uh, <clears throat> I started in Bombay. I went south and then east, went south of Australia, south of New Zealand, south of the South American continent, south of Africa, and got back to, uh, to Bombay. Uh, and I took four stops en route. I'll talk about them as we, as we go ahead. Uh, next, please. Yes, and when I was doing this research, I realized, you know, I, I sort of uh, checked out some other statistics and I realized that, uh, you know, there are more people have been to space or to Mount Everest than the number of solo circumnavigators. At that time, there were about 170 people who had done solo circumnavigator uh, navigation and no Indian had done it before. Also, by, by the thumb rules, which I saw, I realized that all previous so-called circumnavigations by Indian boats like Samudra, Trishna, uh, none of them were uh, uh, counted as circumnavigations because it was, uh, they all went through Panama Canal. So I had a choice. I could have, you know, because the Navy had told me to chart my own route and give them a plan. Uh, I could have gone through the Panama Canal and that would have been an easy way. And it uh, would have been nicer too, going through the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and stuff. But that wouldn't have been a real circumnavigation. And I wanted to do the real deal. So uh, I decided to go, the, the, do it the proper way. Now the most important uh, thing in a circumnavigation is obviously the boat. If your boat is strong, if your boat lasts, you last. If your boat doesn't survive, if your boat is going to break up in between, uh, you're not going to survive. The best of the sailors will drown. So, and, and so I, start, I started searching for a boat. And uh, as I was doing that, the, uh, Admiral Auti uh, dropped another bombshell and he said that the boat had to be built in India. Uh, and uh, that, that was quite a challenge because I had not seen any, anyone build a boat of, of the standards I needed. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I think someone someone just bounced on the. So I had never seen a boat of of this specification being built in India, and we started searching for a boat builder. Uh, we. Uh, it's interesting that just. Uh, uh, day before, uh, we heard all this uh, Atma Nirvarta and uh, self-reliance and make in India and stuff. And uh, we had started doing this in 2007, long before these terms were coined. So anyway, that was Admiral Auti's vision. Uh, uh, so we started looking for a boat builder and he found an excellent boat builder in Goa. His name is Mr. Ratnagar Dandekar. And his company's name is Aquarius Shipyard Private Limited. Uh, can we have the next slide? So we started building the boat. This picture is a little distorted, but you'll find a lot of pictures on my website, thefirstindian.com or on, on the net. Uh, and we finally built this boat after about 14 months of effort. Uh, this is a Dutch design called Van der Stad. Uh, and we bought the design and then we built it out of uh, wood core and fiberglass. And then we started sailing her. So, uh, to, to sail, uh, once we started sailing her, uh, I also realized that I had to train myself. There was no one in the country to train me because no one in the country had done a solo circumnavigation. I had the uh, good fortune to go and work with Sir Robin Knox Johnston. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of him, he is uh, a legend in the sailing world. And he's the first person to have sailed solo and non-stop around the world in 1968-69. Uh, so I had a privilege to go and work with him. I learned uh, uh, a lot of stuff from him. I came back and then I had to build the boat and uh, train myself. So to train myself, we started sailing the boat around Goa. 
and um, the navy shortly gave me uh, a, a, a companion a sailing mate uh, avilash tommy uh, to help me out uh, with with my training and with my project so together we sailed to colombo and to mauritius and i dropped him in mauritius and sailed back alone for the first time in my life uh, by and by we we continued we improved kept improving the boat we kept improving our sailing skills and on 19th august 2009 i set off from bombay on on my boat madri uh, my first stop was also fremantle in australia can we have the next one so i put together some pictures of the boat not necessarily in a uh, to give you an idea uh, of uh, what it is how big it is she is she is uh, uh, she measures 56 feet in length uh, about 5 5 feet in uh, uh, 15 feet of beam and uh, she's got a mast that is about 25 meters high uh, and it's a basic sloop rig design uh, uh, very well uh, very forgiving boat easy to handle by one person though she is so big she is quite easy to uh, she is easy to uh, she is quite forgiving and easy to handle uh, this is her entering uh, cape town so like i said i started from bombay on 19th august 2009 uh, my first uh, uh, stop was uh, fremantle australia on the west coast of australia uh the second one was littleton in uh, new zealand on the south south island of new zealand uh the third one was in falkland islands uh port stanley in falkland islands the fourth one was at cape town which is where this picture was taken as i as i entered the uh, the harbor and of course after cape town i headed straight back home so i finished my trip in 19th may Uh, on on 19th may 2010 uh, which is next week i'll complete 10 years of uh, finishing the trip uh, uh, so i'll i'll just quickly browse through some photographs of this trip uh, can i have the next one yeah that's that's uh, madai and i entering uh, uh, port stanley uh, you can this picture gives you a good idea of how big the sails are and how big the boat is because you can see me a little dark shape standing right at the back and steering the boat it's a beautiful town port stanley and uh, you know it's a must must visit for anyone i would i would i would recommend next that's the core team uh, uh from left to right uh, ratnagar dandekar the boat builder uh admiral auti the mentor of this project whose idea it was in the first place abhilash tommy uh, who helped me do everything and get ready get get me and the boat ready for the trip and he came in every port to help me out get, and uh, get her ready for the next trip next leg and that's me without the signature beard uh, which i grew after the circumnavigation uh, some trips like this is a a pod of whales that came visiting the boat and it was a lovely lovely uh, feel uh, moment when uh, i was my boat was completely surrounded by these big whales uh, even the their babies were bigger than the boat and uh, they played around with the boat for a bit and then they i think they lost interest because we are too slow for them and they went away their way so these are the lovely moments uh, of uh, you know long distance ocean sailing and you can never see them either you can see them in your national geographic documentaries but if you really want to see them in real life and really experience them you have to get, uh, get on to a boat and go to sea next that's the final uh, 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 trip i like i said i came back on 19th may 2010 i was uh, i was a bit early the vice president of india um, i decided to uh, come and receive me uh, on 22nd of may so i came in on 19th may very quietly at night and then on 22nd may i went out again and put up this big flag and came in for a big ceremonial reception uh, so that was the end of sagar parikrama
as the name, which is what I had volunteered for. But I didn't want to stop it here. I wanted this whole uh, knowledge and experience that we had gained for the first time in the country to continue. And uh, so I decided to, uh, you know, help out others and pass on my knowledge to as many people as possible. So within six months of uh, finishing my trip, uh, can we have the next slide? I, along with a crew of three more, uh, three more uh, officers, uh, naval officers, we started from Cape Town uh, and sailed to, uh, sorry, we, we started from Goa and sailed to Cape Town. This is us entering Cape Town on a blustery morning uh, with al almost uh, 25, 30 knots of wind blowing. Uh, so the idea was to train the new crew uh, and pass on my experience and knowledge to them. And uh, then we took part uh, in a race from Cape Town to Rio. It's called the Cape to Rio race. It is the oldest uh, race in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and at, at Rio, I uh, got off the boat uh, for the first time actually and uh, uh, handed over the boat to Abhilash. Abhilash sailed the boat back from uh, Rio to Cape Town uh, with one crew and he dropped his crew at, uh, at Cape Town and then sailed alone for the first time from Cape Town to Goa. And the, the, the rest of his story, I'm sure you will hear from his, from his own words uh, next week. So that was the Cape to Rio race. Uh, next. Yeah, that's again uh, me entering uh, Cape Town uh, during the circumnavigation. Next. So, so the story continued. We came back from Cape to Rio Reyes. Abhilaj got the boat back safely. He, he got uh, the boat ready. Uh, we, and then finally the Navy uh, uh, agreed uh, for him to do a non-stop solo circumnavigation, which he started on 1st November 2012. And after sailing for 150 days, he finished the trip on 31st March 2013 to become the first Indian to sail solo and non-stop around the world. Uh, the idea was that uh, I, I was the first to do the trip, uh, the circumnavigation, but the idea was to build on it and take on bigger challenges, more difficult, difficult trips. So uh, his, his trip was uh, definitely after the, my four stop trip, definitely more difficult by doing it, uh, you know, non-stop. Well, I will, uh, you, you should hear the story from him uh, about his story in his own words. So I'll, I will uh, move on. Next. Uh, after Abhilash, I saw of Abhilash in Bombay for his solo non-stop trip. Uh, I got a chance to go and sail on Suheli. She's for those of you who are not much aware, she is the first boat to have sailed solo and non-stop around the world in 68, 69. And interestingly, she was built in Bombay between 63 and 65 by Sir Robin Knox Johnston, uh, who built her in Bombay and then sa uh, sailed her from Bombay to uh, uh, England via Cape of Good Hope. And then... Uh, in 68, 69, sailed her non-stop around the world. So the boat is still in good condition. Sir Robin has maintained her very well. And uh, I got a chance to sail her then, and of course, in uh, subsequent trips also. But this was quite the, uh, you know, high point of my, my sailing career to sail on the Suheli with her, uh, you know, iconic skipper. Next. Then uh, a year later, uh, Admiral Auti, Again, as a, in fact, as Abhilash's trip was getting over in 2013, Admiral Lauti said that now we should take on the next challenge. So, uh, so the next challenge, he said, you know, let's have a woman going around the world. Uh, so we decided to start uh, giving uh, women a chance in the Navy to, to sail on, uh, on Madei because in the Navy, uh, women officers don't go to sea. Uh, so we said, uh, we quietly decided that, you know, let them sail on Madhavi first. And, and, and that is how we uh, hatched the plan for the next Cape to Rio participation in the next Cape to Rio race and took part in the race. This time we had a, 
uh, women officer, uh, Lieutenant Commander Shweta Kapoor with us, uh, who sailed all the way from Goa to Cape Town to Rio. Like in the in the previous Cape to Rio race, I handed over the boat to Commander Satish in Rio, and I flew back while he sailed the boat back. He and his crew sailed the boat back from Cape Town, uh, from Rio to Cape Town and back to Goa. Next. In 2015, I got a chance to sail with Sir Robin on his per high performance boat, an Open 60, uh, a thoroughbred racing boat. And uh, I joined him in, in Grenada in the Caribbean, sailed from Grenada to Bermuda, from Bermuda to the US, and, and from Newport, Rhode Island on the east coast of, of US. We took part in the Transat, Transatlantic 2015 race uh, from uh, US to England. So uh, the, the reason I, I specifically put this, this picture was that, you know, in India, we, we all have a, a sort of mindset that uh, competitive sailing just involves dinghy sailing. When, when someone talks about sailing in India, he or she only thinks about sailing within the harbor and in small dinghies. But remember, there are big races like these, big boats, 60 footers. We had a hundred... 100 footer boat in the race and and they crisscross uh, the world's oceans as part of racing so those who are you know uh, the young ones uh, the the young sailors aspiring to be uh, to take up sailing as a career this is a totally different avenue for you next then in 2000 uh, well in 2015 itself we had started working on, on this uh, all-women's uh, circumnavigation team. Uh, six Indian naval officers, all women, uh, trained on Mahadei, and uh, subsequently the Navy built a new boat for them, Tarini, and then they say, did a circumnavigation on Tarini uh, in 2017-18. In uh, uh, the interesting part was none of them had any major sailing experience before they joined the project. And within three years, they had trained themselves uh, to be good enough to do a circumnavigation. Again, uh, I'm sure Suem will get uh, some of them to talk to you and it'll be best to hear the story from their own mouth. Uh, next. Well, I left the Navy in 2016. And I got tired of uh, talking the same thing again and again. So I wrote a book, The First Indian, uh, giving all this uh, story about my circumnavigation. And then started sailing with Sir Robin. And in, in 2018, I got a chance to sail with him to Greenland on his 56-feet boat. Uh, so that's the picture uh, uh, where we sailed to Greenland, uh, dodging icebergs in the month of August. And had a, had a chance to dive under an iceberg and so on. So that was another adventure uh, that I would always remember. Uh, after that, in 2019, I bought a, in fact, in 2018 itself, I bought a 40-footer boat, a 40-footer uh, sailboat, uh, which again built by Ratnagar Dandekar, and uh, sailed her, uh, uh, started sailing her along the Indian coast. And now uh, my partner and I, uh, my partner Sujata, uh, who is also a, a, a accomplished sailor in her own right, she sailed across the uh, South Atlantic on a 70-footer boat uh, as part of a crew member of a, of a team of the Clipper race. So two of us uh, sailed the boat around and we decided that, you know, so far I've been sailing in the Navy uh, and, and the Navy... Uh, gives out its boats only for naval personnel to use, rightfully so. Uh, so we decided to bring this to uh, more people and let, let anyone in the country or anyone in the world who, who was, uh, you know, willing to sail uh, and get an experience of sailing beyond sight of land uh, into the open ocean, give them that experience. So uh, that is what we do on Antara. Uh, we've been sailing her now for the last couple of months and uh, done a few charters between Bombay and Goa. And we take people around um, and, and they are welcome to come and sail with us, learn about sailing and be part of the crew. I'll uh, end this with a short...
short clip of Antara and then uh, the house will be open for questions. Can we have the video please? Yeah, can we have the video? Yep. See you soon. Send me the video. Yeah, yeah. The wind picked up absolutely perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Dilip, you still there? Yes, very much. Okay, I can so, see you. Good. So I think uh, fantastic. I think it's uh, you know one of those uh, uh, moments where I think a lot of us really have wanted to come on to Antara and do it, but then there's always a gap between wanting to do it and actually doing it. So hopefully uh, we'll have a big crowd on Antara, and so there are, there are um, in a sense. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been a very interactive. But there are, I have at least about 10, 15 questions which I can ask you. Myself, okay, okay, the audience, uh, which is uh, uh, what are the <coughs> worst sea conditions you ever faced, and did those sea conditions which you faced on the entire voyage have an impact on your physical body? Uh, this is I think the Kankatla of ICH. Okay, uh, the worst sea conditions I faced were about. Uh, Eight to nine meters of swell and uh, about uh, 50 to 60 knots of wind. And it was, it was terrible, absolutely. I mean, it's very nice to talk about it now. But uh, that time I was really in doubt about my survival. Uh, it, well, it, it passes and, and you, you survive and then, you know, you thank your stars for surviving. Uh, but... If you ask me any any permanent uh, effect of it, no, it's, it just remains in your memory. That's it. Yeah. The uh, actually before I continue, I'd like to uh, very specifically thank uh, Surekha Datra and Harish Margam of ICH for having you know coordinated all these meetings. I think this is probably our sixth talk, and thanks mm -hmm. very thanks very much, Harish. Uh, let me continue with the uh, questions. Uh, how did you think of the name for the board, Mahade? Uh, the name um, for the boat Madhi, uh, the Mandavi River in Goa, as you know, which goes by Panji, which is the main river in Goa, it is, uh, it is called Mandavi, but the old name of the Mandavi River is Madhi. And, uh, and we built the boat on the banks of, uh, of the Madhi River. Uh, and the, the river is still called Madhi in Karnataka, in the upper reaches. So that was one reason. And also we found these... Uh, stone tablets about 2000 years old in the forests of Goa uh, where they have a, a picture of a boat goddess on a boat uh, and uh, she is worshipped as a sailor's goddess and her name is Made. In fact, in fact, that goddess gives its name to the river and, and that's how the river is named Made. Uh, so it has a dual significance. Uh, it's the name of the boat god, local boat goddess and also the river on whose banks we build this boat. Thanks. Um, did you ever, during your childhood, 
uh, while you were much younger, dream of that you would ever circumnavigate solo? No. <laughs> That's a short answer. I, 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 I did, I did ima- dream of, you know, sailing and going to the sea, sea beyond the horizon and seeing what is there and all that. But, uh, but uh, no, I did not get a chance to sail or anything. So can you just quickly describe, uh, you know, from your childhood, your first experiences with the sea, your first experiences with sailing, and quickly get us to, uh, you know, the sequence of events that happened in your mind and in your circumstances that led you well, to... I, I grew up in Bombay. So, so I, uh, sea was nothing new to me. I mean, going to sea and going to swim in the sea and all was nothing new to me. Because you're growing in Bombay and then, you know, you go uh, for holidays along the coast and stuff like that. But it was all done by land. Uh, and, uh, well, I, uh, there was, uh, my, my dad had been in the army and I, I had a few uncles and all in the army, but no one in the Navy. So in that sense, I did not have much experience of, uh, you know, ships and stuff like that. I joined the NDA, I volunteered for the Navy. And uh, and even in NDA, I wasn't really t- uh, too much uh, into sailing. I, I rarely went to Peacock Bay. I was more interested in ra- horse riding, actually. And it's only after leaving NDA and joining the Navy, I realized that there are no more horses available in the Navy. So I started sailing. And I had a, a lot of good friends, my course mates, along with me, who were good sailors. Uh, you know most of the names. Uh, Neil Debras, Sean Clark, Atul Sinha, so many of them. Uh, and, and we learned sailing from them. Uh, and, uh, and that's how I started sailing, actually. Sure. There's a question here from uh, Sandeep Jain. Is, uh, how did you train physically and mentally for this long journey? And days uh, in water, how challenging was it to stay alone in the middle of the ocean? And how did you face that? So physical and mental training and uh, did you train and how did you face those challenges? Okay, the, the short answer for, uh, for the physical and mental training is I did not. Uh, I did not have the time to do any of those. And, uh, you know, uh, like a good Indian, I got, I got inundated with advice about how I should do the mental training and I, how I should go for a run every morning and, and so on. But I, I used to be so exhausted by the end of the day. Uh, you know, uh, dealing with the bureaucracy, getting the boat, uh, the, the uh, you know, build, uh, getting uh, with the boat building and, and so on. So I did not do any specific training. But uh, if you are working on a boat yourself, most of the time, uh, you know, I don't think you need any specific, uh, specific training because uh, the boat exhausts you quite a lot. Working on the boat, a big boat like Madhi, is, is quite tiring and that itself I think is a is good physical exercise. As to mental training, uh, again, uh, I don't know, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, sort of feel the necessity of it uh, because I was so involved with the project almost to the point of obsession that uh, when I, when I, when I, what I did, uh, you know, I, I, did, I, I was completely focused on what I was doing. So I don't think any mental training was, was required. Okay, there's a question from Dhanya Pilo and uh, uh, would like to have an insight into how you prepared and planned for food, meals, and the problems you had with food en route. What were your learnings with how to eat and sustain nutrition throughout the trip? So, yes, uh, food and nutrition is a very, very important, I think, part of the preparation for a trip like this. Uh, I would say it is almost as uh, uh, as important as, uh, you know, Preparing your, I mean, it's part of preparing your boat, of course. Uh, so, uh, in in my case, uh, my mother helped me a lot with the with the whole uh, planning and preparation of food. She uh, experimented for almost two years before I set out uh, with different, uh, you know, uh, stuff like pohas and sabudana khichdi and stuff like that, and make them in a sort of easy to cook, ready to eat format. Uh, also, uh, I. Uh, I took a lot of variety of food with me. Luckily, I don't have any sort of, you know, dietary restrictions and I, I eat uh, everything. Uh, so, uh, I, I would take a lot of variety of stuff and, and make sure that I was always, uh, you know, eating well. Uh, 
and uh, as, as to cooking and all i was quite used to cooking uh, on my own so that helped because uh, you know i could uh, on a good day uh, good sale i could uh, make myself a nice meal and because food is doesn't only nourish you and uh, fill your stomach it also has a as a big uh, psychological effect on you if you are low if you're not feeling too well some day you make a nice meal for yourself sit down have it with the sunset and you know it it lifts up your spirits uh, so yes there was a whole lot of uh, preparation and and planning that went on to that okay there's a question from anu and just a minute um what is the future of offshore sailing for the indian coastline with the number of ocean sailors from india increasing and which indian ports have a future in offshore sailing i think the future is very bright with such a big coastline uh, lovely weather we have good weather almost if you compare it with the uh, say with england or uh, you know um, places like australia or england or something we have good weather almost uh, i would say 9 to 10 months a year uh, and such a large coastline uh, most of it is inhabited uh, so you have small little ports uh, all along the coastline and uh, there is no reason why we should not be uh, going out to sea more and uh, doing offshore sailing uh, we made a few trips to uh, places like ratnagiri the clip you saw was uh, shot in ratnagiri by a friend uh, we made a trip to devgarh to murud janjira to vijayadurg uh, and uh, uh, all of them beautiful places lovely places it will help if some infrastructure better infrastructure is built of course uh, that way you know uh, people can stop and do short day sails also between port and port to port so yes there is no reason for uh, for us to you know grow into a big uh, offshore sailing nation uh what would be the bare minimum no frills uh, cost of a voyage a certain navigation like this uh, what would be the total expenses including the cost of boat etc now that's a, that's that's a tough one because it depends on the boat you have so i i say i did a circumnavigation on a 56 foot boat uh, and so did tommy and and, and the girls uh, because we had that boat and we had the the luxury of the navy uh, paying for it but there are people who have uh, sailed in uh, you know uh, 30 footers and 40 footers too and and then uh, that brings down the cost uh, substantially so it's very difficult to put a ballpark figure on on this but uh, very roughly yes you got to be ready for a couple of crores at least uh, because eventually that expenditure will pick up whether you buy an old boat a small boat you know Uh, uh and and the bulk of your expenditure remember is on the boat in fact 90% of the expenditure is for the boat itself because once you start sailing there is no expense you're not using much of diesel uh, you, all your maybe for electricity generation or something you'll be using your diesel and uh, you're eating some uh, you know you're eating food which is which you would eat on land anyway Uh, and the port charges and all are not that high for sail boats so it is all the money all uh, gets sucked in by the by the boat do you have a training program of sorts which can help others learn i mean do you have you already have antara on the water and do you think you're going to migrate that to a uh, i'm not saying necessarily circumnavigation but at least a cross cross ocean uh, sailing program where people can come with you come to you and train well i i haven't done any structured uh, sort of program yet people have been suggesting to me uh, but uh, this was antara's first season so we needed to check out uh, for ourselves what the response is uh, uh, you know for the sailings what we are doing because what happens is if you if you make a training program then you have to stick to it and then uh, you know that sort of uh, may, it then it means that you can't do anything during that time Uh, so so far we haven't uh, uh, gone that way uh, but uh, depending on the uh, on the response and depending on interest of people yes there is no no reason why we can't do something like that it it will all depend on what sort of uh, you know uh, uh, how many people really want to do it and 
and uh, and 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 whether we can do it or not sure uh, would you recommend uh, as what would you recommend as the first baby steps in india to get into the groove of long distance ocean sailing so assume we start something like on the beach i think i think the most important in fact the biggest hurdle uh, in india uh which is stopping people from going to sea is the lack of marinas because it's it's a bit of a chicken and egg story because people don't have mar- we, we don't have marinas in the country it's very difficult to keep a boat safe and I, we are also facing this big problem in in antara uh, and uh, in goa and and we see how difficult it is to maintain a boat in bombay too and it becomes expensive so if we have a good infrastructure of marinas you know it will be easier for people to buy a boat and and keep her there and then uh, that 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 sort of encourages people to buy boats and if we have boats people will eventually sail so marinas is the solution for india but <clears throat> let's assume that you 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 know you do india maldives or india mauritius and stuff what would you think uh, are the first few voyages that you can organize and people can start training with you um one is again you know often people uh, ask me uh, you know training for a ocean ocean uh, they want to become ocean sailors they want to become offshore sailors and uh, they 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 say that you know where are you going to sail from I, and my my stock answer is i can sail from goa because once i go into the sea the sea is the same everywhere whether it's in, it's in you know of maldives or of mauritius or of 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 goa so you can you can get the same experience here at and come back to your home port but uh, gradually if you want to go to a foreign port uh, then um, maldives yes mauritius is a lovely destination uh, if you have the time because it takes time about 20 days to reach mauritius on a sailboat uh, so that is where i will start i would start with uh, more than maldives because maldives again you have to stay on moorings and all i would probably start from maybe sri lanka and then on to mauritius or go to andamans uh let's get back to your voyage and or maybe even all your voyages put together what were the most uh, apprehensive and scary moments uh, of your trip and what were also it's a double question what were the most uh, exhilarating and thrilling points of your all your voyages so apprehensive moments like like i said i was facing 8 9 meters of swells and 50 60 knots of wind and my steering broke uh, so that is like you know uh, it, it, you're terrified i was terrified i mean there is no sorry we just is, yeah give me back there is there is no there is no denying that you are you are you know terrified in such moments uh, and of course if the boat is okay even then it's you know you 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 think that you will survive but if the steering breaks and you are you know desperately trying to repair things and uh, get her going and and stuff yeah so that's quite a terrifying moment the funny part is when when that is happening you are so busy in you know keeping yourself uh, afloat that uh, it uh, you just don't think about it it's only later that you start uh, you know wondering ki how did you go through it uh, there are good moments too like i showed you the 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 uh, school of whales around the boat uh, or you know watching beautiful sunrises and sunsets and generally the whole uh, solitude at sea uh having no time table uh, being your own person uh, you know for days on uh, that is a lovely moment too this reminds me i had a chat i was in fact uh, following uh, tommy's first voyage and uh, we were chatting on facebook if i remember or whatever the medium and uh, one of the things he told me struck me as he says uh, one of the apprehensions i have is coming back to shore and once again learning how to deal with people did you have a similar apprehension <coughs> how do you deal with it well it takes time he's right it takes time uh, because what happens is uh, at sea you have been used to being on your own you are used to not talking to anyone except maybe to yourself or the boat which you don't do 
I mean, okay, you you can talk, but it's sort of a silent conversation. Uh, and you know, not not getting too much hassle with noise and stuff like that. And then when suddenly one fine day you finish your trip and you are ashore, and uh, now everyone is vying for your attention. You are giving you know half a dozen interviews a day, and uh, parroting the same answers to every journalist who is more or less asking you the same questions. Uh, and everyone expects you to pay full attention to them and and that becomes uh, quite uh, quite tiring actually and and sometimes uh, downright uh, you know irritating so it takes some time to uh, to get over it and uh, you know to sort of uh, uh, like we do in a day to day life you know ignore some sounds some noises and uh, you know get used to the the rest of them uh, so yeah that takes a little uh, getting used to again thanks captain dilip i think this was a really very unusual and different kind of uh, talk and we hope to have more and more and encourage more and more people to come on uh, board at least antara you can count on uh, a lot of us from at least from hyderabad coming on to antara this uh, coming winter as soon as we the lockdown uh, lifts uh, thanks very much guys there's going to be a poll and you know that there is going to be a series you're going to have abhilash tomi talking about his first voyage uh this coming sunday and then thereafter hopefully we'll have tarni and trishna and abhilash's golden globe voyage also thanks very much and please uh, respond to the uh, poll and please come on to the whatsapp group because all the announcements will be made on to the whatsapp group i will send you the link so that you can register this is the poll which we've just starting and we'd like you to respond to that thanks uh, captain and look forward to uh, some more talks from you in future Thanks it's a pleasure talking to fellow sailors thanks for calling me bye